So I was listening to a very interesting lecture by a clinical psychologist who was talking about how our hyper-rational minds have now squelched human experience from any kind of relationship with the transcendent. And yet we know existentially and philosophically and psychologically, as Tolstoy used to say, that we require a way of bridging the finite with the infinite. That the reality of our condition, that our mortality, that our abject finitude is psychologically unbearable unless we find some map of meaning, right? Some bridge between ourselves and the infinite and the transcendent. It seems to be a psychological prerequisite for operating in the world for creatures who require meaning, for self-aware beings, for creatures that are aware that they're aware. See, it turns out that having the kind of consciousness that we have comes <laughs> with a set of issues, right? It's both a blessing and a curse because it renders us uniquely aware, right? We have the mental capacity to ponder the infinite, yet we're housed in heart-bumping, breath-gasping, decaying bodies. So we are simultaneously gods and worms, right? <laughs> Sheldon Solomon says the explicit awareness that you're a breathing piece of defecating meat destined to die and ultimately no more significant than a lizard or a potato is not especially uplifting. Brilliantly said, right? Hits you like a fist in the stomach. What is an existential breakdown? What is a nervous breakdown? What is a panic attack? What is an implosion of our sense of security and... <laughs> stability for our personality when it is a moment in which the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves is no longer convincing. It is a moment in which the incomprehensibility of the cosmos makes itself <laughs> palpable. It is the moment in which we realize that we are naked and trembling before the cosmos. We may be a clever primate, but we feel damn small. And so we have these hyper-rational minds, we've developed brilliant scientific tools and techniques of inquiry that ha have allowed us to demystify the world, to shrink it down to size, to create space shuttles and iPhones and all these marvelous tools and technologies, aircrafts that fly through the sky. We transcend the limits of geography, we transcend the limits of gravity, we engender a kind of divine godhood for ourselves, and yet we still die. And so how do we deal with this conundrum? How do we deal with this anxiety? How do we respond to our situation? Some people turn to religion. Some people turn to biblical maps of meaning that can orient us in the world and that offer a different kind, perhaps a deeper form of truth, right? As Alan de Botton says, beyond the literal grid, <laughs> right? So it's this idea that there's a kind of poetic truth that is beyond the literal grid. You know, a journalist may be more accurate in describing the details of an event, but this is perhaps a kind of naive realism compared to the poet's interpretation of a particular experience, which finds no place in the literal grid. Werner Herzog talks about the same thing when he speaks about cinema as a portal to some kind of deeper reality, so some kind of noetic truth about the human condition. He says that Cinema is about ecstatic truth, right? Not just about facts. If you're after facts, he says, look at the phone book. It's full of facts, but it doesn't illuminate. It is story. It is mythology. It is truth with a capital T that seems to <laughs> soften or quiet our faint disquiet, right? It silences the fire in the belly. It, it, it resolves or absolves us of our existential angst. Now, I'm not saying, again, that I'm religious or that I'm spiritual, but what I'm saying is that I understand the mystery that beckons. I understand how the hunger for ultimate meaning and ultimate explanation haunts the human animal. We are pregnant with a need for signification, and without it, our thirst will never be quenched. My entire life is a response to this anxiety, and I'm the most secular person of all. I love science and airplanes and aviation 
and our capacity to literally overcome our limits using engineering, using mathematics, but I want to know the mind of God too. I want to have my way with the cosmos, right? It's like when Jodie Foster in the movie Contact goes through the wormhole and witnesses a celestial event as she gawks at literally a star system on the other side of the galaxy. She says they should have sent a poet. They should have sent a poet. The whole human urge for exploration while cloaked right in science is ultimately about a need or a search for transcendence. Marina Benjamin says when we dream of space, we look to the stars, we dream of transcendence, we dream of what we might become. And there are other <laughs> pathways to transcendence. There is a uh, sort of psychedelic experience. You could always partake in visionary shamanic plants that will blast new tunnels between the mind and the others that will literally force you into an encounter with the logos. You can also jump out of a plane. You can have energetic sex with a beautiful girl. I mean, there are all kinds of ways to glimpse the infinite, but at the end it's a subjective experience that is not reducible to objective fact. And so it leaves us with a continued conundrum even amidst our search and our yearning. <sighs> Who knows, maybe the answer is within. As Ayn Rand wrote, I went to God just to see and I was looking at me. So maybe look within, start within. Blessings.